today we are discussing the important topic of reverts or rever reverting to Islam but also reverting to Islam in the context of understanding Islamic versus Muslim culture. Now when we talk about this concept of the culture or adopting the Islamic culture, something that always comes up is uh, when we convert to Islam, we either get given a Muslim name or in many uh, situations, many instances, we, there's pressure uh, imposed upon us to take a Muslim name. And in some cases it's almost presented as if it's wajib and if you don't do it you know you haven't really converted wholeheartedly mm. it's almost like you're, you're serving two masters you're muslim but at the end of the day you're still holding on to your past so brother you need to take a muslim name what, what's your position on on this should we or should we not uh, adopt a muslim name I've, in the past i used to think we should you know everybody a muslim wherever they come from they should at least change their uh, their first name you know, to have because it's part of the Islamic di um, identity or Muslim identity to be known with a Muslim name. But over the years, I think I've I've developed a a, a view where, you know, some people don't want to change their name, and, and that's cool too. But from my you know from my perspective, I changed my name more because at, um, my my understanding and coming into Islam was from a, a cultural perspective or a cultural reawakening as a descendant of an African. I was a follower of, of Malcolm X or a student of Malcolm X at least. <clears throat> ideologically so I was coming from a position of my colonial past and, and my um, disassociation with Africa so then becoming a Muslim was part of a, um, a cultural reawakening as an African descendant it wasn't just a spiritual it was a social political s step or move and so to change my name and to change my last name to be known with a Muslim name was like breaking away from the slave master Whereas I understood that there were some people who didn't have the same background as me. Islam is universal, so their family name doesn't lead back to an oppressor. It leads back to their ancestor. Hmm. So I would understand, oh, they changed their first name because, you know, they want to be known as a Muslim by their first name. But, you know, they're keeping their family name. Some people, they, they did the other way around. They kept their first name because that's the name my mum gave me. So that's precious to me. But that first, but the second name is a... Um, the name of an oppressor. So I don't recognise that name. Hence Malcolm X taking an X, for example. But, um... I guess it's there's room for diversity and people have a choice and you know you might meet someone that's a Muslim and they've been a Muslim and they say yeah their name is John and then you say okay oh if you just uh, how long have you been Muslim ago like like 19 years or 25 years ago okay okay <laughs> and it's just okay they don't need an explanation or you know it's their business hmm. he kept his name his name is John or Jeff or whatever that's his business really we shouldn't be focused on the label. Mm. We should be, you know, we're not more point. in tune with, with the content of what the person is about. Good point. That really tells us who they are, their actions and who they are. So. It's definitely an individual decision and people feel very differently about this. Mm -hmm. I have known some people who changed their name and years later regretted it or changed it back. And some people who were grateful that they did this. I think what bothers me, which I got a little bit of, of in your question, of course you can let me know if I'm right about this, is when people impose what you should do. And you hear both things, uh, even from uh, religious leaders, they'll give both sets of advice. You have one group that says you do need to change your name, basically you're saying Shahada today, what do you want to change your name to? which sometimes some people don't want to give that up, like you said, their mother gave it to them. And it can be very disturbing for a family to see their child suddenly reject the name that they were given. Uh, that's something people learn after the fact. Uh, on the other hand, I have had plenty of Muslims, again, even people in positions of readers, religious leadership, tell me that you should never change your name. It is your name. And, for example, in Iran, there's plenty of Farsi names that are not Arabic. True. They're not historically Islamic. Your name but being... being <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you but in, in, in any case, um, that being said, I think that's not really uh, the right thing to tell people either. Because, as you just mentioned, having a name which is odd for a Muslim, such as Steve, is, it is a lot of pressure. Like I was saying before, you walk into the job interview, they expect something different than mm. their walks in, especially for a lady. And like you were saying about the clothing, it's very natural to want to express your Islamic identity throughout your life if it's very important to you. And the name is one of the primary expressions of our identity. And furthermore, I am, if you love Ahlul Bayt, for example, or you love Allah or some uh, beautiful facet of 
the Islamic the past, VR, right? yeah. Bilal, for example, or mm -hmm. you know anyone else. It's very normal to want to identify yourself with them, mm -hmm. and I don't see why anyone should criticize someone for that, especially if they're not in that person's shoes. So again, I think the best thing to do if someone is confused about this, should I change my name or not, um, you know, perhaps offer our advice, but let them work it out. I do have to say there's one thing I'm not comfortable with, and a lot of people are, but I'm different, I suppose. I'm not so c comfortable with split personalities. You know, you have people who have two names, like in the Muslim community there are Fatima, and then outside there, I don't know. Not Steve. <laughs> so, so, not Steve, <laughs> no, no, but no, some, no, some other name. Be a problem. <laughs> and I understand it's, sometimes people like having nicknames, but I feel like, to, to me a name is important and is very powerful. I suppose it's sort of maybe a Native American idea or something, the power of the name. But it, it is, and I believe one person, one name, one way of doing things. But that works for some people too, so I'm not going to criticize them. That's just how I feel about it. That's a quite interesting point. I'll tell you why, because I am one of those people who... Uh, when I converted to Islam, I didn't want anybody to give me a name. I chose the name that I now bear myself. However, I still go by the name that my parents g gave me. In fact, on my passport, hence the reason why I always have visa tr troubles when I'm trying to go to a Muslim country, <laughs> because they, they can't believe that this African name, which has no bearing with Islam, could belong to somebody who's a Muslim. There's no Muslim reference here whatsoever. So... I tend to have to get letters written by scholars to say, you know, he is a Muslim. It's but, a difficult of a shahada. Yeah, you know, literally, <laughs> quite so literally. So you're yeah. But the, the point is that um, these two names that I now bear are, are two names that I go by. So, for example, if you're a Muslim and you ask me what's my name, I'll say my name is Rauf or Abdul Rauf, whatever. And if you ask me what my name is and you're not a Muslim, just out of practice, it's become the norm for me to give you my non-Muslim name. Now, that does not mean to say that if this is somebody that I would get to know, they would know within two or three conversations that this person is a Muslim, because obviously it's my identity, you know, and as we said earlier, it's not a religion, it's a way of life. But I have the two, and they kind of run uh, concurrent to mm -hmm. me. Uh, um, and you're, you're saying that maybe you think that there's a, this is problematic in so, certain circumstances. Well, it does work for a lot of people. Clearly it works for you, and I understand the desire to synthesize your origin uh, with the Islamic identity, and, and indeed uh, we are supposed to call ourselves after our fathers, you know, we're not supposed to kind of cut off our lineage, regardless of whether or not our lineage is Muslim or not. Um, it may again also be different for ladies, although many ladies have the two names, just that if I meet a non-Muslim, they're still going to look at me as, as a Muslim, mm. and if I say my name is, oh I don't know. It's hard to come up with names on the spur of the moment. You could just use your original name. Yes, but I'm not going to. <laughs> uh, but, um, y y you know, sometimes you get the look. because and, it, and, and on the other hand, that is part of establishing an Islamic presence in the West, so that Muslims do have names like John, like mm. Diane, like Sarah, and, you know, all the other names which we don't necessarily think of as Muslim names. There is one thing, though, that I, I really don't like. Um, I, I get it mostly in, in the Middle East and so forth. And that is, someone asks you what your name is. You say, Amina. And they say, no. What's your real name? Yeah. And yeah. it's like, well, I just told you my name. Why are you questioning me? And I feel like almost this is, it's like an assault on your identity. I, I guess I do give some power to the idea of name for whatever reason. And not that I feel like my own personal identity inside myself is threatened, but they're not accepting it. Mm. I've said I'm Amina. Let's go on to the next question. Why are you questioning who I'm saying I am? And I think this maybe points to sort of a, a, a broader issue. But yeah. more, more importantly, Islam is universal. So why would, you be not, why would you be surprised or need to go dig deeper? If a person tells you their name and they say I'm a Muslim, course. then you would assume of regardless of their ethnicity, of that's their name. But I think, uh, especially in the West, having been a Muslim now for 16 years or so, coming up to 16 years, I think... We reverts have been able to maybe over time and through interaction with the born Muslims, and I'm not, not trying to suggest that they're all ignorant, but we've been able to change their own perceptions of what a revert is, for example. 
And I suppose this process needs to happen also in the East as well, where in certain circumstances, maybe because they don't interact with contact, contacts maybe, on, a, yeah. on, a, on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, they're still maybe stuck maybe 10 years behind. Whereas in, in this country, if you interact with a, a born Muslim and you tell him, oh, my name is John or Steve, whereas 10 years ago, he might think, is this guy really a Muslim? Nowadays, it's like, all right, cool. Yeah. Salaam alaikum, Steve. Yeah, it wouldn't yeah. be an issue anymore. Yeah, yeah. So... Obviously, we have a role, uh, with, and I think this is an important debate that we can maybe discuss on another day. What about language, Sister Amina? Should we, would we be selling out if I become a Muslim and I'm obviously I'm praying five times a day and as you know, we have to pray in the language of Arabic and then I say to myself, well, you know what, this Qur'an which helped me become a Muslim through me reading it in English, I feel like I want to recite it in the original language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it in. So I want to learn Arabic. Will I be selling out by attempting to learn Arabic? Well, obviously not. I feel it is essential to learn Arabic to connect with the revelation. Now, of course, you don't need to know Arabic to be a good Muslim or to go to Jannah. God knows there's, you know, many millions of people who have passed on who, you know, maybe they could recite the Holy Quran, but they didn't speak Arabic. Uh, but as anyone who does learn uh, classical Arabic, even to a rudimentary degree, knows, uh, the access you have to the word of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is different. The mm -hmm. enjoyment is different. And you can also add on to that the fact that historically Arabic was the language of the Ummah up until modern times. Most of our scholarship and history was carried out in that. And so there is a vast amount of Islamic culture that in a sense is very tied to the Arabic language. Now, of course, much of it has been translated into English, uh, but it helps just to, to get a broader perspective too. And that's nothing to do with necessarily wanting to be another ethnicity. And I think this is something perhaps, uh, you know, your friends or relatives who are not Muslim won't understand. You know, when you're sitting there sneaking those Arabic books into class and studying, it's not so much that I'm trying to become another ethnicity, but it's because this language is very tied to who I am as a Muslim, and I would like to expand my cultural knowledge. And I use that very loosely, not meaning Middle Eastern culture, but the, you know, vast Islamic culture, which uh, has united the Muslim Ummah throughout history to, to be able to to access that. And so I think I think it's one of the most valuable things you can do if, if you can learn Arabic or even some other historical Islamic languages mm. as well. I think that's quite important because also when you were mentioning, you know, the, the many revered scholars from, from times past, uh, Arabic was the, if you like, the... the, the like a lingua franca, yeah, really, yeah, isn't it? Exactly. Really, yeah. But not only that, a lot of them were not native Arabs themselves. They learnt the language. They were like Turkish or, yeah. you know, from Central Asia or Persian, but they learnt the language of Arabic, which, as, as you say, was a, a common language of all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm assuming you would agree with this, this yeah, idea. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I have to concur with what sister saying that. One, it gives you more um, access to the Qur'an, um, but also, as a way of if you can speak Arabic, you know, fluently, then when you travel around the Muslim world, you always, regardless of what country it is, even if it's a non-Arab um, country and culture, you're still going to be able to speak with some Muslims who don't speak English, for example. That there will be somebody amongst that can speak Arabic, uh -huh. you know. And I've seen this, you know, practically executed. So I, I think it's a good thing. I wouldn't think it's a, um, you know, even an issue of, of selling out really. No. Not okay. What about our? Well, let me say not our. I think I've already <laughs> exposed my, my viewpoint on the, on, on, on the next question I'm going to ask. When we talk about Islamic history, Islamic literature, and so on and so forth, do we consider this, in other words, Islamic heritage, do we, do you, would you consider this to be ours or theirs, i.e. at that point, if you like, or, of reverting to Islam? I would, I would say ours. I would say, I, I personally, I think... Um, Hours. When I say if I ever do um, public speaking and I open up, I always say um, I'm greeting the language of peace and of paradise, the language of our mothers and our forefathers. So I mean that also because I'm, I'm aware of, um, you know, say for example, my 
pater my maternal grandfather is from Manchester province in, in province in Jamaica, and I know that they had in Manchester province in I think it is the 17th century they had a big Islamic uprising, a big jihad that happened there because it was um, you know Muslims from Africa, you know knowledgeable in Maliki fiqh and stuff like this. So they had this you know resistance. So I know on one level I could think of it as forefather that maybe I've got some kind of biological connection with West you know with West Africa and West African Muslims. But also, I mean it in a spiritual sense, higher than that. The language of our mothers and forefathers, meaning the people that came before us that gave us the good examples, regardless of where they came from. You know, because uh, there is, you know, there's a, you know, people have biological connections, but people have a, you know, higher connection as well. You know, you say brother, you know, you're not my mum's son or my dad's son. You say ikhwan, you know, but it's, it's a very deep, deep meaning to, you know, to ahi and ikhwan more than just, you know, blood brother. Yeah, and without upsetting any of my brothers if they ever see this show when, when we say brother as well to technically speaking this person is closer to you because of that spiritual connection than your own blood brother yeah and I think also anything that's happened in Islamic history that is connected to Islam so I don't necessarily mean some communist movement somewhere <coughs> yeah, but something that was inspired by our faith mm. or our scriptures or our beliefs or some trend in Islamic history uh, it, it is part of our history because not only because these were your brothers and sisters who have passed on but who are doing this but because they're the ones who have handed down to us what we have mm -hmm. uh, for example the hadith scholars who collected all of these uh, texts in the Sunni and the Shi'i traditions um, I may have absolutely no biological relationship to them, but they have very strongly impacted who I am today. They are part of my personal history, so to speak. And one thing this brings up when you mention different heritages is learn the question of learning other languages that are common in the Islamic world. And I think this might even be where the kind of selling out sort of thing comes in among some people, like, oh, you know, well, you're not a Turk. Why are you learning Turkish? Uh, Turkish, for some reason, doesn't seem to be a major issue among some people. I'm just picking a nationality uh, and but I don't I wouldn't see it that way and I would say that if there's a language where a significant Islamic heritage has been expressed in which for example Farsi there's a lot of Islamic literature historically and particularly in the Shi'i school of thought today in Farsi Urdu Turkish uh, many languages in Africa and Central Asia and so forth um, in a sense, I would say it's part of your heritage. Now, very nationalistic people from these countries might get very mad, but it is part of the Islamic heritage. And if you are able to learn it, it opens doors. And it doesn't mean you need to give up who you are, but it means you can appreciate more about what's happened in the past. Of course, learning languages, any language, opens doors to human communication. But you know, particularly with seeing what has happened uh, as part of what I would also consider our history, and particularly as a Shia Muslim, I just have to say from a very personal perspective, I was blessed, honestly, in that I picked up a decent fluency in Farsi before I actually became Shia. Um, not perfect, but enough to understand a majlis, for example, or some poetry or noha. And in a sense, I have realized, you know, first of all, this gave me access to sources of knowledge that I wouldn't have had otherwise that shaped who I was. Not that I was out there to become Iranian, but to hear certain ulama speak. But second, I think even more importantly, as on a human level, to participate in communal religious expression, because this obviously is something a lot of people who are English only, you know, they, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem, you know. You go to the Medjus, for example, in Urdu, you know, everyone is crying, you don't understand what, what the person is saying, you feel left out, and you, you, can't, you can't participate and express your belief and identity with other people. And this is sort of a human need, and it's something that also gives us strength. So, of course, it shouldn't be a requirement to learn a, quote, Islamic heritage language in order to participate with the community, and especially in the West. And this is why we have Ahl Bayt TV, Alhamdulillah, and so forth. Uh, but it does allow us to connect with all of the expression that's gone on in history, the poetry, the literature, uh, and so forth, that is part of uh, who we are as an ummah. And of course, when, you, when you're referring to the Majalis, for example, in particular, this is a prime example of, if you like, many centuries of a, if you like, civilization or a practice, a heritage, which is now culminating in what we see today. So, yeah, no doubt that's very important. Yeah, and with the language thing, too, <coughs> something anyone who speaks more than one language will say, people... They almost act differently when they speak mm. another language. True, I mean, true. if we both bust out in Spanish right now, we'll, we'll be, in a sense, different people, or Arabic. And I find with Islam, 
it is expressed differently in different languages too. There are certain things, for example, which sound very normal in Farsi. But if you translate them from English to Farsi, they sound off the wall. Mm. And yet when you say them in English, they sound very right. And I think th the more uh, windows you have to kind of the historical development of the expression of Islam or how people do it, I, I think the broader you your viewpoint of Islam can be. It's not just limited to how one culture or one uh, ethnic group has perhaps mm. uh, lived these values that we are sharing in. And that can add to the richness of your life and your experience. If, even, even the Muslims are... Uh you know, non non Islamic language, non Muslim culture languages, just to to benefit from scho um, mm. scholastically. Greek, Greek, yeah, yeah, learning like yeah. Greek and um, Latin. Latin. Latin's a yeah. famous. You know, Muslims <coughs> in Spain, the Moors really you know penetrated Latin quite deeply, and mm. you know, it was just just to, to, to get that window, as you said, and get more yeah. access. Really, so mm. I think it's a skill set. It's just good. It's good yeah, thing. I think it's just quite an interesting debate as well because this this isn't just restricted to to Muslims and Islam. Even you know, one one of the debates we're having in this country is the poor uptake of of a second language. You know, everybody speaks English and. Technically, we're becoming very lazy of learning another don't, language. Probably don't speak English that well. Eh? Well, well, no, exactly. <laughs> but the, the point is, you know, and one of the arguments is when you speak another language, you know, it opens up a, a kind of different window in, in your in your mindset and your viewpoint of the world. So, of course, that that would uh, apply to us as Muslims as well. What about because obviously we're discussing culture, Muslim culture versus Islamic culture. Especially for those who are the followers of the debate, when when people revert to Islam, to Shia Islam, where should they place themselves? For example, I mean, we've been speaking about Iranian culture, and then you have the Gujarati, Punjabi, Urdu, so on and so forth. Of course, Arabic as well. Where does one go? I mean, Alhamdulillah, we have a lot more centres now that cater for an English uh, crowd, but even that. It tends to be specific to a particular community from a particular part of the world. Where should we go as weavers? Well, I think the advantage to being different in the community, not having your ethnic center to go to, is that you can go everywhere and people understand. It's not like, well, what are you doing here? You're Koja. You know, this is the Iraqi mosque or whatever. You do have the freedom to participate. Um, in communal worship and expression of Islamic traditions uh, with Muslims from other backgrounds who don't necessarily think it's the weirdest thing, thing in the world you may be there. Uh, of course, not to say they would be weirded out by someone else, but, but they get it, that you don't have somewhere of your own to go. Not that you're necessarily always going to be 100% accepted. You, you'll meet the, um, the odd person in, in the Islamic center who has something odd to tell you. Uh, but I do think this is one of the advantages, and again, it allows you to to see the many different ways in which Islam is practiced, and also uh, to weigh them against each other. Uh, to see, for example, it helps with the Islam versus culture debate, Definitely. if you see, for example, people from the subcontinent do things one way, not that they all do things the same way, but in general, people from Iran do them another way, well, which is the Islamic way, or are both okay? And I think uh, if you don't have this exposure to many different expressions of Islam and Islamic values, you can sometimes run the risk of mixing them. Mm. Uh, you know, especially if someone is trying to learn about Islam. And, you know, that may or may not be a bad thing. It's not like every cultural value is bad, but I think what I see most, especially among women, is picking up negative ideas about women or unnecessary restrictions and really internalizing that with a lot of sort of shame and guilt that I have to kind of match this. Whereas you find not even all Muslims are necessarily agreeing that this is the way that things need to be to be done. Okay. I, I mean, I like the idea of, of um, moving around. I do like the idea of moving around. Um, the it would be beautiful to have, you know, our own place as reverts, but the advantage is well, there are kind of, you know, spots that you could say are you know like revert spots but you know essentially not having our own, our own place it does or should at least give you an extra push to bounce around whereas i you know i'm um you know go to any center there's a lecture on it's, it's in english it's this speaker you know it's about this topic i'll go it could be either side of london either of the four corners of london whereas i do um know some muslim brothers from a particular say ethnic group and or just, you know, get caught up in this scholarly thing or, you know, you're going to go to the lecture over such and such a place and, oh, and it's a bit of a, a shadow wall, you know, it's a bit of a, a cloud like we can't go there where I'll go, you know, any Islamic centre and even um, 
you know, whether it doesn't have to be a Shia center, it could just be, um, you know, somebody coming in from the US or wherever to come and speak. I'm like, okay, they might have something interesting to say, or it's about a particular topic on there, you know, and as long as it's a Muslim center, you know, I'll, Sunni, Shia, whatever, you know, I just don't have that partisan loyalty. I must only go to this place and it must be about this particular center and these particular Muslims, and, you know, just, you know, move around, man, you know, Alhamdulillah. see, yeah. see, see the I, place, you know. And I think the, the important point as well with regards to, as you say, bouncing around the different centres is that you don't get stuck in a rut. You don't get stuck in maybe seeing things through the eyes of a particular yeah, place. And yeah. when you go to different places, there are, you, you do see differences. I mean, you know, they're not necessarily major differences, but there are different ways of practising the, the deen, especially in terms of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, for reasons that we can maybe discuss on another show, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're going to have to finish it there. Uh, once again, as always, it's been a very interesting discussion, inshallah, and uh, hopefully we'll meet again in a not too distant future where we can uh, tackle some more of these uh, particular issues which are obviously very pertinent to us as reverts and of course to all of us as Muslims because there's always this uh, overlapping. Thank you once again for joining us. Assalamu alaikum.